Welcome to another episode in our game programming series. Um, we're going to continue uh, our game loop implementation. And so if you haven't watched the other episodes yet, I will link them in the description. Um, a quick rundown is that we uh, went through the uh, how a game loop works on a high level, a real simple game loop, and then we started implementing it in Rust. Uh, we've got to a point where we're actually showing something on the screen in terms of the uh, milliseconds it takes for one loop to run. Uh, but it's still a very simple game loop and it still needs a lot of refactoring. And also um, I needed more information, more knowledge about how a more advanced game loop works. And so what I want to do first is I want to take a look at what we described last time. And based on uh, my reading of the uh, game uh, programming patterns book um, by uh, Robert Nystrom, uh, I want to update what I know now compared to what I uh, uh, what we implemented in the last couple of episodes. And so let's start by looking at the uh, the input update and render part. So as we mentioned last time, in a simple game loop, you go from the input to the uh, so you receive input from the from the player, you update the game state to the current state, and then you render that state to the player using the screen uh, and also audio. Um, and so what I also mentioned is that, well, by doing it this way, you couple the update and the rendering part together. So if, you're, um, if you have a powerful machine, you might be running at 100 frames per second. The updater will also run at 100 updates per second. But if your machine is, uh, there is something running in the background uh, that reduces the, the, the resources that the game has to, to consume, then your frames per second would go down to 80 frames per second, for example, or 60 and your updates per second would also go down. Now, um, the issue there is that if you couple the updating to the renderer, you have a variable time step in which you update the game to the current situation. And basically what you want to achieve is if you take a, a, um, a time, and this is the real, real now, and this is the game time, What you want to achieve is to close the gap between the game time and the real now until you are actually up to date and the game is running at, at the real current timestamp. And so basically, um, so in this, in this loop above, where you go from input, update, render, and then back to input again, say that it takes, um, I don't know, 10 or 20 milliseconds, let's say 20 milliseconds to run, then that means that the real time has advanced since the, since the start of this tick by 20 milliseconds. And so the next tick, we need to advance the game state another 20 milliseconds to catch up to the real time. And then the next tick, we need to update the game uh, for the amount of time it took for the, for the tick before that to run. And so you continuously update the game state towards the current time in the, in the real world. And you, and your systems, your, your AI, um, um, your physics, uh, any other system that you have, they might also be interested in how much time has changed since the last time I updated my, my, the knowledge that I have. Um, and so you say, for example, that in run one, you need to, uh, in run one took 20 milliseconds, and so in run two, you, you tell the update, you tell the updater, well, you need to update for 20 milliseconds because we are 20, 20 milliseconds behind the real time. And so you, you, all, all these systems will then have to know, okay, I need to update 20 milliseconds. What does this mean for my system? And then the next loop, well, actually this time it took me 24 milliseconds. So now you need to update your, update your systems for 24 milliseconds. And so you have this variable uh, time step where your systems in your update logic constantly have to take into account that the updating is not in a fixed time step. So it could be 20 milliseconds in one, uh, one update cycle, the next time 24, the next time 30, the next time 15. So it, it varies con continuously. And um, the problem there is that th this makes it much more difficult to implement your systems. It, make it, it makes it easy, easy to implement the, the game loop because you just pass in how long it took for the last loop to run and your update, your systems in the update uh, section will, will handle the rest. But you also need to implement those systems. So ideally, you would like your game, uh, your 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 game tick, your game loop to handle that, and then your systems can work with a fixed time step. And the way to do that um, is that, as we as we mentioned before, is we have this this 
this arrow here which says well say that we um, want to want run at 100 updates per second that means that we need the the uh, we need to uh, increment the time by 10 milliseconds for every update well we if we if we need to increment by 20 milliseconds we can do just we can do two update runs and then after those two update runs we're back to now and then we can we can render and because we run update twice we just we don't have to tell the systems behind the update well this time we're updating uh, 15 this time we're updating by 25 milliseconds no it's always we're updating by 10 milliseconds but i might update you more than once uh, before i render but those systems have no knowledge of actually what rendering means so they don't need to take it into account so they just they get a, they get a fixed time step of 10 milliseconds in which they update the game state to move towards the real world and so by doing that so let's uh, let's draw this out so let's say um, let's say we've we've had one game tick already and that game tick in total took um, let's say so we've got updating which is blue so the updating took four milliseconds and the rendering took seven milliseconds and so we're not we're not yet interested in how many updates were performed just the total amount of updates took four milliseconds the total amount of rendering took uh, seven milliseconds and so in total we've got this this tick took 11 real-time milliseconds to run so we've got a counter that says uh, I'm now 11 milliseconds and so if you go to the next update we've got 11 milliseconds and remember we want to hit those 100 updates per second and so if we divide uh, those uh, 1000 uh, milliseconds uh, by 100 we can see that we we, uh, we want to update at increments of 10 milliseconds for every update so uh, let's see well we we can do one we've got 11 milliseconds to catch up we want to update increments of 10 so we can do one update to go from 11 um let's let's back up a bit let's make this a bit simpler uh, at, at first and then we'll dive into the more the the, 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 the second part so let's say that we have a, an exact amount of 10 milliseconds here so again, our update takes 10 milliseconds, so we can do one update again, and let's say it takes uh, 4 milliseconds. We've done uh, for one update, and so we've done uh, times one update plus, and again we'll do one render and we'll say it, it, this time it was a bit faster, so it took 6 milliseconds. Again, we have uh, so it's four. So we have ten milliseconds of real time that it took to update this. We advanced the game state by ten milliseconds, but it only took us four milliseconds to do the rendering, and then another six milliseconds to do the um, to do uh, sorry four milliseconds to do the updating, and another six milliseconds to do the rendering. So again, we are at ten milliseconds. But now let's say we have, um, um, and so this is. So before we dive in deeper, so by doing this, say that we, uh, let's take another example and say, again, it took us, uh, uh, we can, again, we can update one cycle of updating. So again, this time it took us three milliseconds uh, times one update. Plus and this time we needed to render some complex particles or whatever. So it took longer to render. And so let's exaggerate this a bit. And let's say it took 27 milliseconds. So now the whole loop combined took three milliseconds plus 20 milliseconds is 30 milliseconds. And so now we actually have a multiple of 10 uh, increments of time that we need to catch up. And so again, um, the next time we run this, uh, this tick, so each of these orange lines are one game loop one tick so this time again it takes um, let's say we're doing some more complex work now so it takes five milliseconds for the runs on average um, but because we are incrementing by 10 milliseconds and we have a, um, a lag or delay 
or we're, we're, we're 30 milliseconds behind the real time, we can run the updater multiple times to catch up. And in this case, 10 times 3 is 30 milliseconds, so we can run the update up three times. So we're doing three updates. And then finally, we're doing another render. This will be another simple render. And so let's say this one took five milliseconds. And so in this case, because the uh, the uh, update took five milliseconds, we did three, so that's 15 milliseconds. We took, we need five milliseconds to do another render. So in this case, we have 20 milliseconds. And as you can see, there's this pattern here where, okay, we do another loop and now we have 20 milliseconds, so we can do two updates before we do the next render. And by doing it this way, we've decoupled. So as you can see, um, the ratio of rendering to, um, see, the ratio of rendering to updating, in this one, it was one to one. In this one, again, it was one to one. In this one, oh, this one also, one to one. And in this one is three to one. So in this one, we did three updates before we did one rendering. And so as you can see, what this means in total is that we're actually, um, we are keeping the exact same update interval. And so we are hitting our 100 updates per second, but we are reducing the amount of up, uh, rendering that we do based on if we need to do more updating or not. And so in the last one, we actually skipped rendering the state of the game for the first two updates because we still we still weren't caught up to the real time. And only after the last update, we did another render. And so in that case, because we took 10 milliseconds more to do the extra update, um, the rendering takes longer. And so the frames per second actually goes down. And so that's where you decouple updating from rendering the rendering goes down if you need more performance to hit your update per second goal that you have. Um, but the updates will always increment by 10 milliseconds. It will always stay at that 100 updates per second. We'll get back to a situation where this isn't the case. But in general, it will hit your 100 updates per second and the rendering will uh, vary. It will still be, if you have a powerful machine, it will still be plentiful. It could be 100, it could be 150, whatever. Um, but if you have a less powerful machine, we'll just make sure that the updating is happening as it should and the rendering can go a bit lower. Uh, and even if there is something in the background that ha that's running, we will still make sure that the updating happens. Rendering will be slower for, for a short, short amount, but eventually it will go back to, um, to, to, the, to the stable frame rate that you had before. Now, there's one situation here that we haven't covered yet. And that's we've been doing these cycles in exact increments of 10 milliseconds. So 10, 10, 30, 20. But there is obviously the case where, well, let's say we so we had this 20 milliseconds. So we can do two uh, updates, which take, um, let's, let's do another uh, four milliseconds uh, times two updates. So now we have eight milliseconds. And let's say it took us uh, another five milliseconds. Well, let's make it six milliseconds. So that's 14 milliseconds that it took us to, to run this, um, this tick. And so now if we go to the next run, we can see where we have, we can update once. So again, let's say four milliseconds times one update. plus, uh, doesn't really matter, let's just call it seven milliseconds. But what happened here is we updated the game by one, uh, by incrementing the update cycle by one. So we caught up by 10 milliseconds. So we reduced the 14 milliseconds to, uh, to minus 10. So we, we are left with four milliseconds that we didn't actually use yet in our updating because as mentioned we want to increment in 10 milliseconds if we were to pass in this four milliseconds again to the updating then all the systems again would be need to take that into account we don't want that and so we are updating uh, we we have some residue time left that we keep track of we, we store this four milliseconds and so in the next cycle uh, in this case the next one uh, would we have four milliseconds plus so let's make this let's make this a bit uh, so let's say this is five milliseconds, for example. And so four plus five is nine milliseconds. So in the next cycle, we wouldn't actually have enough time to um, to do another update cycle. So we would just do the rendering again and we would wait for another update. But actually we had some residue from the last update cycle. 
So we need to add the four milliseconds. So you would get, instead of nine, you would get 13 milliseconds. And in this case, we would have enough to do the rendering again, or to do the updating again, and then the rendering. So you keep track of this, but then there is the issue of actually rendering this to the screen. So in all the previous examples, we the updating was able to, by updating the stage by increments of 10 milliseconds, we were constantly able to exactly match the real time in our update cycle. So we needed to catch up, in the first one we needed to catch up by 10 milliseconds, so we did one update cycle um, to catch up, because we consumed 10 milliseconds in the update cycle, and so now the game time and the real time are exactly the same again. And that moved on and on until where we had 14 milliseconds. So we did one update, so we reduced it by 10, we had four milliseconds left, and now we are not updating anymore, at least in this stick. And so when we render the game, the rendering, if it took the state of the game based on what the update, uh, the update cycle changed in the state, that state would be in the past. It would be the real time it was four minutes, four milliseconds further ahead. And so if we were to render that state, we would actually render a past state of the game, not the actual state of the game right now. Now, in game terms, it is the actual state of the game because the only the update actually changes the state of the game. The rendering only takes the snapshot of the state and then shows that to you and plays audio and whatever else is needed. It doesn't change the state, only the update um, um, method or function actually changes the state. And so what the what we have in this situation is, let's, let's take an example. So we'll say this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is 10, and so um, this is, uh, let's, let's make it easy for ourselves. And let's say we've got, a, um, we've got a car here, very pretty car, two wheels, it seems. So the car is on position, position zero in the last update cycle. So, it, so when this, uh, so we'll just, um, We'll just make this up, but let's say after this, where is it? After this update cycle here, the car was positioned at position zero. The car is moving at 10 positions, let's just call it positions for now, for every update cycle. So every millisecond, the car moves by one position. And so what we have here is that the, um, um, the next cycle, if we were to update the car and nothing changed in the velocity of the car, the car would be moved to position 10. But we haven't, up we haven't run that cycle yet. We haven't run that update function yet because we didn't have enough real world time. Remember, we only have four milliseconds left, so we didn't update the game state yet. But if we, were to, if we want to render the, the game right now, so red is rendering, if we were to render it right now, based on the state of the game, we would render it, render it at position zero. Because that's what the state of the game is actually telling us, the, the car is at position zero. But then the next cycle, because we are, let's say we, we added 16 milliseconds to, to, um, uh, to this four milliseconds, so we, we could update two cycles, it was going at 10 uh, positions per, per update cycle, we would actually have to run the car at position 20. So it would suddenly jump from position zero to position 20. And so you, on your screen, you would see actually the car jumping from one position to another because there's no smooth transition between zero and 20. It's just at one point you're at position zero and at the other point you're at position 20. What we want to do instead actually is we want to interpolate where the car is probably, it, it's probably going to be in the next update cycle and we render where it is right now based on that knowledge. And so the way we do that is we have this four, uh, these four milliseconds here. And so if we call uh, update, sorry, not update, but render, we actually pass in those four milliseconds. Oops, do it correctly. We pass in those four milliseconds and actually what we're doing is we're dividing. So we're saying based on the 
uh, one tick is 10 milliseconds. So this is 0 0.4 is what we're passing in actually to the render function. And so we're saying you can interpolate that wherever the velocity of the car is telling us that it will be in the next update cycle, position it at 40% of that range. So the next update cycle would position it at position 10, again, because the car is moving at 10 positions per update cycle. Uh, but actually, because we are interpolating, we're saying, well, we're putting the car at position four. And so instead of moving it to uh, keeping it at position zero, we're interpolating and telling, well, we uh, the car is currently at position, this is a car, yes, it's a car. The car is currently at position four. And so what you get is you get the car moving from, instead of going from zero to 20, it will go from zero to four to 20. Again, that's a big cut, but a jump again, because we're working with, with lower numbers right now, but in reality, it would interpolate and would go, for example, from instead of going from zero to three, it would render at zero, one, and three. And so you would get a, a smoother uh, transition there. And so this is a way to uh, to avoid stuttering on your screen because you, 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 you won't always be able to update the game at the exact point of, or sorry, to render the game at the, at the exact now moment, because there could still be some residue time that the updater hasn't caught up with yet. Um, uh, but, and so you, you interpolate that and you render it at where you expect the car to be at your current position. Now, the one problem here is this is an interpolation. So again, this is, this is basically guessing. So you're guessing that based on real data, you're saying, well, the car, the car has a velocity of 10 uh, and we're 40% of the way there. We, we haven't done the next update yet. So I'm going to position it at position four. But what happens if between the you rendering or your game rendering the car position four, we go to the next loop, we start the next tick, we look for the input, and apparently the player has hit the brakes after the last update, but before the next update. The player has hit the, the, the controller that, that makes the car slow down. And so we interpolated it to be um, at four, but actually the car stopped at position two, for example, because of it hitting the brakes. And so when you update the next cycle and you render it, you would have to move the car back from position four to position three. And so that's what is, um, that's what's happening in this case. Uh, well, actually that's what, that's what could happen if your interpolation is wrong. But that's the, the idea here is that if you don't do this, you are almost guaranteed to every frame be incorrect in where you position the car. So you would see a lot of stuttering. If you do do this, then you are interpolating 90% of the time you're interpolating correct because the player is uh, most of the time it's either driving straight or taking corner smoothly so the, the the curvature of the of the corner is is the same throughout the corner so there aren't a lot of sudden changes in in, in your car moving um, and even if there is we're talking about um, small numbers here but in large numbers again remember we're updating 100 times per second so even if this happens, it's almost invisible that the car had to be rendered. It had to be, so it was rendered at position four and now suddenly it had to be rendered at position two. So you would see the car jumping back, but that's not actually what you see in the game because of it happening so fast. But if you didn't do this, you would have the stuttering and that's something that you would definitely constantly see. So that's why this, this technique is implemented where the renderer interpolates what it thinks is going to happen based on the data that it currently has but it might not be accurate, but most of the time it actually is. So that's one part of decoupling the updater and the renderer. And so in this situation, we would have the updater running multiple times if it needs to, to catch up, and then the renderer running one time per tick to render what's actually the current state. It interpolates that state to make sure that it's rendering what, it, what is expected to be the now situation, basically. So this is the ideal situation. There's one more thing that we need to cover, and that's the fact that um, the if you have a, if if you have a powerful machine, then this works. If you have a slower machine, then this wouldn't work, because we decoupled updating and rendering. So updating stays at one hundred. Rendering will go down. But even if it, if your machine can actually uh, keep up to one hundred updates per second, because for example you have difficult computations that you do in your update cycle, uh, and so it takes quite a long time. And so if you can't reach those, uh, you can't get to those 100 updates per second, 
and you're slowing down to 90, 80, 70 updates per second, well, actually, what happens in that case, if we if we look at the uh, the update cycle here, so it tries to, um, let's, let's do one more here. So we, um, let's see, where is it? So we had, what was the time? So we had 13 milliseconds to go. So we update uh, one, uh, we, we call one update cycle, but actually that update cycle took 19 milliseconds to run. And so one update. What happens here is that after it, it's done the updating, it was expected to have caught up to the real time or at least caught up enough until there is uh, some residue left that is used for the interpolation. But in this case, the time is actually increasing because we had uh, was it? We had 30 milliseconds before, and now because we took 90 milliseconds, we're actually increasing that time of 30 milliseconds. And so the updater will continuously keep running and trying to catch up with with the, uh, catch the game time up to the real time, but it's unable to do so because the updating actually takes more time than we're than the 10 milliseconds that we're trying to update the game time. And that's where you get into a, a, a deadlock situation, basically where the updater continues keeps running. Um, the renderer asks, "When can I when I can I render to the screen?" The updater says, "Hang on a second, I'm still trying to catch up," and it just never catches up. So the renderer keeps waiting. No frames are rendered anymore. In the background, the updater is still running, but it's actually falling further and further behind to the real time because it's updating the game as a state. It's just not able to catch up to now, and this, that's when your game just basically freezes because nothing is rendered anymore, and. Um, so in order to solve this, and this is something we're going to do uh, probably in a, in, a, in a couple of episodes from now, we'll continue to work work on this system and we'll make it uh, more uh, advanced and more robust as we go. But in order to solve some, a situation like this, you could say, for example, well, the updater is only allowed to run five times within one tick, for example. So it tries to update the, um, so it, it runs this one, it keeps running this in order to try to get to the real time it's not able to do so, and so at some point it says, okay, I can catch up. Uh, here you go, renderer. This is the current state that I know right now. It's way it's way in the past. We haven't caught up yet, but render whatever you can you do, whatever you can with this. And so the render does interpolation and it tries to, to, to show you what, what is what is uh, what is the current state actually. Um, but what happens there is that at least you can still render the game, but the game just slows down because the updater is unable to catch up to real time. And so it runs. It, it continues to run smooth because you you you've you've kept the update time to a, a minimum, so five five cycles at most, for example. So the rendering uh, smooth is is relative, of course. It would still because you have a relatively low system, a uh, low spec system, the FPS wouldn't be that high. But at least it's still running and it's it's uh, it's chugging along. But it's it's slowing down. The time is decreasing in the game in the game. Actually, it's it's feeling as if you're running at half speed, for example. Um, and this works if uh, there is something happening where some background tasks start spinning up. It takes a couple of seconds to do its, its job. The game just can't keep up to one uh, updates per second anymore. So it, it slows down. It still has these increments of 10 milliseconds. So the systems don't have to account for any of this. It's just that the game starts slowing. It takes longer to, to, to achieve uh, in real time as than, uh, at that moment than what it took before. Uh, but eventually, when when the background task uh, is done and you get more resource uh, available to the game again, the game the update can catch up again and it will continue where where basically with a with a normal running game. Now, obviously, this also doesn't work if your system is really so slow that it's just impossible for it to keep up and it just keeps falling behind. You can still play; it's just in a kind of slow motion situation, um, and it's just not fun. But at least the game is you can do something in the game. You can. You can definitely say, well, okay, this game isn't working, it's, it's rendering slowly, so I'll just quit the game. It, it doesn't hang at least. Uh, and so that's, so obviously you can account for every situation, just that, that's why there is this concept of minimum specifications or, or minimum specs for your machine and, and re recommended specs. At some point you'll just have to say, this machine just is incapable of running a game of this complexity. Um, so yeah, so this is a, uh, so this is a more advanced in that loop uh, based on the game program patterns book that I've been reading that explains how this situation works. And this is also what we're going to work towards to in the, in the game, uh, in our implementation. 
Um, so yeah, so um, I'm going to put a cut in this video. We've been running for uh, about 30 minutes now, so I'm going to put a cut in here, and then we're going to go in depth into uh, changing the code. Um, I'm going to start with showing the frames per second and the updates per second. Then we're going to um, to move towards this system where we decouple updating from rendering. And finally, we're going to uh, work towards um, limiting the number of updates that can happen and also allowing you to control the time, simulate the time it takes for an update to happen or a render to happen. And in, uh, by doing that, we can actually, um, uh, we can simulate what happens when you have a slower system or faster system, etc. And so that's just something that I think is cool as, a, as, a, as an end goal to have with this project. Obviously, the end goal of the project itself is for a usable library that can be used in the game uh, that we're working on. Uh, but let's get to the next step first, and we'll do that in the next episode. And I hope to see you there. Bye-bye.